Let's get started, folks. Good morning. Um, let me introduce myself. My name is Rupak Parekh. I'm uh, co-founder and VP of engineering at Platform 9. I have Amrish Kapoor here. He's architect at the vSphere engineering team at Platform 9. And we have Pushkar, who is uh, part of the engineering team for the vSphere. And we have Ken Hui, who's sitting over there. He's uh, director of technical marketing at Platform 9. So today, we are going to talk about OpenStack and how Platform 9 was able to make it work with existing brownfield environments. Before we go into the technical depth, uh, depths of that topic, let me talk about Platform 9, its architecture a little bit, just for a couple of slides, and then I will have Amrish talk in detail about the architecture. So Platform 9 was founded two years ago in 2013 by early VMware engineers. We wanted to use OpenStack and make it really easy. So think about, uh, about Platform 9 as an easy button <coughs> for OpenStack. We also provide OpenStack as a service. We host the OpenStack controller in our data center. You bring your own servers, we connect to that, and boom, OpenStack is up and running. And we are hiring. We are based in San Francisco Bay Area, Sunnyville. So if you're interested, uh, I would be here after the session. Quick overview of the architecture. Uh, as I spoke about, we have the blue box on the top, which is the Platform 9 Cloud, where we run NOAA API, Scheduler, Conductor, Glance API Registry, Keystone, and various other OpenStack services along with some Platform 9 services which really make it happen. <coughs> the green boxes down on the bottom are the data centers of our customers and their hypervisors. So on the left-hand side, you have Linux, KVM. This is what we support, uh, which runs a Platform 9 agent connecting back to Platform 9 cloud. And on the right-hand side, we have the vSphere environment where you have the ESX hypervisor with VMware vCenter server, which connects to the Platform 9 appliance, which is essentially the same agent, but in an appliance form, connecting back, back to Platform 9 Cloud. And this is how we connect it and make it work. So coming to this talk, why are we doing that? Why do we want to make OpenStack work with the Brownfield environment? Well, what we have seen is most of the project <coughs> starts really small. You have one or two hypervisors with some virtual machines running. You add more servers, you have some more virtual machines running. Before you know it, you need a cloud. And you, don't, you haven't really realized it yet. Virtualization has been there for ages. And people have large virtualization setups without a true cloud. So how do you go from there to true cloud? And believe it or not, when we talk to our customers, infrastructure as a service is still new. People have virtualization, but cloud is not there. So we want to remove the silos. And foremost of all, we have seen strong customer demand for that, especially on the VMware side, where they have a lot of virtual machines running. They want to use OpenStack, but they have existing virtual machine. How do you take those virtual machines into the cloud? And the last thing that I want to mention, uh, Platform 9 has been working with OpenStack for the last two years. So we want to contribute this particular thing back to the community. And uh, Amrish is going to talk a little bit more about the challenges and the solution that we have came up with. Over to you, Amrish. Thanks, Rupak. So now that we spoke about the motivation for why all of this is useful, let's get into the how. Once we started looking at this problem, the first thing we wanted to do was classify the different asset types that people cared about having uh, discovered from their environment. So for each host or cluster, which is a currency on uh, the vSphere world, uh, we were interested in discovering not just VM instances, but the networks they connect to, um, their IP addresses on these networks, as well as any images or templates that these instances were spawned from. Um, this is applicable on KVM just as it is on vSphere. So I'll be switching between both hypervisor types during my talk. So starting with VM instances, right? Um, the way we approach this problem was to create a periodic synchronization task that would check for instances on the hypervisor. Again, um, the same applies to both vCenter and KVM. Any new instance that was found on the hypervisor would then be reported as a new OpenStack instance, 
with the appropriate metadata, whether that includes a name, UUID, block device mapping, etc. Now, to complete this loop, instances that don't exist on the hypervisor but had previously been reported to the database also need to be cleaned up so that the synchronization is maintained on both fronts. So all of the uh, sync task components basically query the hypervisor and tell Nova Conductor, here's, an IP, uh, here's a VM instance I found, add it to the database. Now that's fairly straightforward, but VM instances can't really exist in a vacuum. So since this discovery occurs at startup, our deployment has to take care of creating a special service tenant and an admin user within that tenant who owns all of these instances that are discovered. Now, all these instances are then owned by this uh, user under the special tenant, but this doesn't mean that you can't go in and create further tenants at appropriate times once you've deployed your OpenStack cloud. So that was one of the problems that we had to address once we started discovering these instances. In addition to this, we also had to worry about flavors and quotas. Like I said, instance discovery happens at startup. So at this point, you don't have any images. You don't know what um, images these instances were spawned from. You don't know what flavors they were created from. So the simple solution here is to create an unknown image and an unknown flavor and let um, instances be built on top of that concept. Now, it turns out that you can still continue using the VM instances um, as you would normally use them, even with this information missing. So things like power operations, instance ownership operations, snapshotting, et cetera, still works. But the one key missing piece is that um, if you don't use quotas, then the instances are pretty um, invisible to OpenStack from an accounting perspective. So even though we used the concept of an unknown flavor, we still took into account all of the uh, quota-related information for each instance. So for example, this included cumulatively establishing the block device mapping so that it would count towards the quota. So when the instances are discovered, they're also discovered as having consumed a certain amount of quota within that tenant. Moving on from instances, we took a similar approach to discovering networks as well. We had a periodic synchronization task that would go into the uh, hypervisor and look for what networks it was uh, reporting. For uh, vCenter, this is basically the switches, port groups, et cetera, that get reported as part of the cluster. On the KVM side, we're reporting Linux bridges that are attached to that hypervisor. So the, the impact of this is that if a network is added to the hypervisor post the fact, it automatically gets discovered and reported to OpenStack as an OpenStack network as well. Because this synchronization task is not just a one-time thing. It continuously keeps monitoring for changes in both directions. So if a network goes away, it makes sure that the, update, the database is updated to take that into account. Similarly, if a network is created, it makes sure that OpenStack is plumbed with a new network as appropriate. So once we have the instances and the networks, the next step is to glue them together and see if we can discover the IP addresses of the instances that we've got in our uh, cloud so far. So the synchronization task here, again, goes to the hypervisor, asks it, OK, these are the instances I know. Um, tell me what IP addresses uh, are occupied by these instances. And we've already discovered the networks in the previous step, so I know how to map those IP addresses to the networks that are now being uh, plumbed into my cloud. Um, this information is reported to Nova, so all of the uh, interfaces, IP addresses, all of the metadata for the instance is now updated in the database tables. The key impact here is that now if you're using any other external to OpenStack technology, let's say you have your own DHCP server set up which is serving IP addresses to your instances, it doesn't need to know about OpenStack because this discovery goes in and periodically keeps pulling the IP addresses that each instance reports. So you can continue using whatever other infrastructure pieces you have while still letting OpenStack know that this is an instance, this is the IP address it consumes, these are the quotas that it uh, contributes towards. Um, the one point to note here is that we're still talking about the context of NOAA networks. We're not talking about Neutron yet. This is future work. We'll get to that in a later slide. But all of this is uh, strictly within the confines of NOAA network. So once we have all of the networking sorted out, as it were, uh, we also wanted to look at seeing if we could use template images. Now, this is vSphere templates, so this is strictly in the vCenter world. Um, and vSphere templates are very similar to VM instances there. So the discovery process here is very similar to how you would discover an instance. You'd go in and say, what are the uh, templates that are housed on this data store that I care about? And I'll report them as new Glance images. So Glance thinks that these were new images that were created within OpenStack 
but we're basically the agent that is creating those images. The key point to note here is that with vCenter, it's very easy to convert between virtual machine instances and templates. So your discovery service has to make sure that if this conversion happens, uh, let's say you convert a virtual machine instance to a template, you have to make sure that Nova drops that instance and Glance gains an image. Now this is great from a vCenter perspective, but what about other image types? So we wanted to give a path for users um, to also be able to use VMDKs, QCartoons, any other image types that are not vSphere templates. And the way we approached that task was to set up a, a predefined folder under each server that could house template images, or sorry, other image types that users cared about plumbing into Glance. So it essentially became a special watch folder, and we had a file watcher process that would go in and keep monitoring that folder for changes. If there were any existing files in there, those would get reported, reported as Glance images. If you added more files in there, those would get reported as new Glance images as well. Um, so all images that were copied to this folder were essentially discovered automatically. You didn't have to deal with Glance. You didn't have to um, try and convert your images into a particular uh, cloud tenant, etc. All of this was taken care of as part of the initial deployment. Now with all of these pieces, we can then put together a complete picture of how all of them work together in concert to create an OpenStack-based private cloud that is actually fully plumbed with all of your existing assets without you having to do anything special. So you can see that the, the hypervisor at the center of it all is providing all of the VM information, the network information, the IP address information, as well as the image information that is needed to set up essentially a private cloud with all of your existing assets. So all of these go into setting up a fully functional private cloud, and you haven't even done anything in terms of uh, operational stuff yet. And this is essentially what we did in our environment as well. So we put all of these tasks together. We made an initial deployment, which was based off of our Platform 9 vSphere infrastructure that we're using internally. We authorized the data stores and clusters that we cared about. Once all these tasks had kicked in and settled in, we were able to create a completely seamless transition to this new OpenStack cloud, which was now serving our underlying infrastructure. This whole process was completely seamless. Um, the teams that were using vCenter actually continued using vCenter while this conversion was in progress. And the reason for that is the synchronization task that we spoke about actually keep both the views of OpenStack as well as the hypervisor in sync. There's, there isn't a one-way communication here. So usually what happens with OpenStack is that OpenStack is a source of truth, right? Once you put OpenStack in place, everything has to go through OpenStack down to the hypervisor and any information that, coming, that comes back is kind of not really understood by OpenStack. So because we put this in place, we could enable teams to continue working with vCenter the way they were while all of this was being plumbed. Once it was in place, teams could switch over to creating new quotas using all of the uh, OpenStack API private cloud goodness and continue working with that API without skipping a beat. And that's how um, we set up our internal infrastructure um, to dig deeper into this a little bit, I'm going to hand over to Pushkar to go through a uh, live demonstration of how all of this works. Pushkar. Thank you, Amrish. So I'll try to have a live demo if the network allows me to do that. Um. So this is the general Platform 9 UI that you will get. This is the Platform 9 OpenStack controller, uh, which is hosted in the cloud. Um, I have one ready for the vCenter environment and another one ready for the KVM environment. What you generally have to do is you'll have to download an appliance for the vCenter environment and an installer for the KVM one. I have already done that, and that's why it's um, waiting for authorization. So basically, um, when we deploy the appliance, it will go ahead and uh, discover a few things about the environment so that the authorization step, basically adding Nova Compute, becomes slightly simpler. For example, when I click on Authorize, it asks me what clusters I want to use with, my, uh, with this deployment. I'll just choose these two uh, clusters, which are our internal dev test and uh, clusters. 
and I'll authorize all the data stores currently uh, available in that under that cluster. What this what this did was it will now install Nova Compute on that appliance and it uh, along with the platform nine components that Amri just talked about and it will start the discovery process uh, um, as and when it starts running. Um, while it's doing that, let's switch over and see the vCenter environment itself in a bit. So these, this is the actual cluster um, that we are looking into. So I just authorized the VMW dog food and the VMW test clusters. So we should start seeing them in some time. It, it takes about <coughs> usually around three to five minutes, but then the time varies depending on the number of instances that are there in that cluster and also depending on the number of clusters that you have authorized. Um, while it's doing that, we can actually go ahead and, okay. So um, st um, because it's still under discovery, um, let I'll just go ahead with the KVM uh, workflow as well. It's similar to that on the vCenter. Here again, it's uh, asking for asking me to authorize it. Um, I'll just assign it the uh, hypervisor role for now uh, and not just click next, next as usual. Um, this will also, this will operation also do the same thing. The um, uh, Nova compute is now being installed on the KVM environment and um, it will start the discovery process as and when the Nova compute has been installed and configured. Uh, if you want to see the, no. So the KVM environment is a demo environment. It's not a live environment. Uh, it is a live environment, but it's not one of the actual clusters. It's a demo environment. So it has just three virtual machines and just one network for now. So once the discovery completes, we will see that um, one network and the three virtual machines pop up here. So at least now it has understood that there are two clusters, but it's still waiting to discover all the virtual machines. It depends on the connectivity also between the appliance and the vCenter environment. Okay, so now the discovery has been completed on the VMware environment. We can see that the, it has discovered 35 instances that are running. And if you see the networks, um, all the networks on those two clusters have been discovered. Let's go to the instances. Even the IP addresses of the instances have been discovered and it's not just the platform nine UI. Um, if I shift to the horizon UI, I have set up um, dev stack horizon to point and pointed it to that uh, particular open uh, platform nine uh, controller. Oh, okay. Let, till it refreshes, let's go over the KVM environment. <laughs> okay, so even here the discovery has been completed. Uh, you should see, yeah, it has discovered that one network that was there on that hypervisor. And on the instances, yeah, all the three instances are now visible here. Like Amrish said, for vCenter uh, view especially, we we discover templates. So what happens if you convert an instance into a template or, or back? So let's try to do that right now and we should be able to do that. Uh, so let's go to this cluster. And I hope Kevin is not going to use this VM for some time. I'm just going to convert it to a template. Now this can sometimes takes time depending again on connectivity that I have right now. Okay. 
Okay, so the VM has been marked as a template in the vCenter view. So we should be able to discover that changes um, instead of waiting for the 10 minutes or the whatever the time of the periodic task might be, I'll just manually go ahead and refresh it directly. Again, now because I'm refreshing, it can take time depending on the size of the vCenter cluster and uh, the number of VMs that are there because all the information will there will be refreshed. Let's go back to the instances view and we should not see the Kevin's VM now. Okay. Let's see if it is seen here. Okay, not yet. But at least it has been partially completed. It has uh, been, uh, it has disappeared from the instances view. And it, ha it now shows up in the images view. So basically you can perform operations on the vCenter and they will be discovered. Uh, they will be discovered in the platform line. Open stack. Okay. Let me try to find the credentials and I will be able to show you that uh, view as well. Thankfully, I had saved those credentials somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> ah, good. Yeah. So it, the instances <laughs> pop up. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, let's look at the images. is taking surprisingly long time today. Yeah. And all the images show up in the horizon view as well. So it's actually an OpenStack controller. So basically you can use horizon or platform nine and it's up to you. Now I'll hand over it, hand it over back to Amrish. Sure, switch back. That's okay. So what Pushkar demonstrated was essentially um, how long this whole process takes in real time. So it really does take the couple of minutes that it took to discover all of your existing assets. Um, and the key point that we want you to take from this is that once that discovery is complete, that is actually a fully functional OpenStack private cloud. So we could have gone ahead, created new instances, we could have gone ahead and created new quotas, new tenants, new users. Um, we could have used all of the existing OpenStack uh, API and all of that would have worked just as if you had set up this private cloud from scratch, except that it's already plumbed with everything that you care about in your infrastructure. Um, before I summarize, I wanted to raise a couple of points that we took as part of the implementation details when we went down this path. Now the discovery that we spoke of, um, we essentially thought of two different ways we could implement this. And the first was to integrate it with each of the uh, parent components that it belongs to. So you'd create a discovery portion in Nova, you'd create a discovery portion in Glance, um, with networks, et cetera. Um, the advantage of this is that you can implement this at the interface layer. You can define uh, proper APIs for how to implement discovery, and every hypervisor or appropriate driver can choose to implement this discovery as appropriate. The disadvantage is that every component that needs discovery will then have to build this at the implementation layer, and that can be a bit of a disruptive change for a whole bunch of OpenStack components. The other option is to implement this as a separate component altogether. So all of the discovery-related work can be housed in its own service, um, in its own component. Uh, the advantage here is that it alleviates the problem from the previous point, which is making sure that um, you can add discovery independently of other components, so there's no disruption to 
the existing components. The disadvantage is that this service then becomes pretty complex because it has to understand a whole bunch of different OpenStack components. It has to understand a whole bunch of different drivers other, under each OpenStack components and then be able to report uh, discovered uh, artifacts back. So um, we chose the first approach, but I just wanted to lay out the different options we considered while um, thinking about this. And the reason I want to lay that out is because when it comes to contributing it back, these are the sort of discussions that we hope to have within the community. In terms of future work, um, as I alluded to earlier, we're working with Nova Networks today. Um, we're still trying to uh, think through the process of how this would work and fit within the Neutron context. Um, we're also trying to see how um, we could build this with volume discovery and what makes sense in Cinder as well. But lastly and most importantly, we want to start um, talking about how we can work within the community and understand the contribution process and figure out how to give this back. Before I take uh, questions, I'll quickly summarize what we just spoke about. Um, we found OpenStack, as do our customers, a great solution to cloudify your internal infrastructure. But if that's the course you're taking, if you're trying to cloudify your existing internal infrastructure, you need to be able to also leverage all of the assets you've built up over time. This is why we created a lot of these pieces to be able to go in and discover these assets and report them to a fully functional OpenStack cloud. The goal was to be able to be uh, completely seamless, which as you saw it was. The goal also was to be able to get up and running within minutes, which again, as you saw it was. Um, and we can, uh, we can reliably claim that you can have a OpenStack cloud up and running in minutes instead of months which was our whole goal. Um, that's all we had. I'll open up the floor for questions to all of us. Now, I was beginning to think it was a flawless <laughs> presentation and there were no questions. <laughs> no, uh, thanks for the presentation. Uh, so just one question I had is, uh, so the the whole workflow that you demonstrated. So at what level of scale have you actually tested this out? I mean, uh, for a couple of VMs you have demonstrated this, but actually in your probably testing environments, like at what level of scale have you gone? And then you know what is the kind of recommended uh, number of VMs or instances sure. that you uh, suggest here? So um, we actually not just tested this, but this is an actual live production use, and we have uh, folks that are using this. Um, in two levels of scale. One is the number of hosts that they have, the number of uh, hypervisors, and that we've tested in the order of hundreds. And we've worked with VM scale in the order of thousands. Um, so that's where we're at today, which is not to say that the process doesn't scale beyond that. It's just what we know of. And in terms of recommendation, um, if the hypervisor can handle it, the discovery can handle it, right? It's not like the discovery adds more load to the hypervisor. Because you have, uh, because you have a periodic task running behind right. this, and then that might take its own time to do the discovery. So I just wanted to, you know, uh, right. basically understand it from that perspective. The semantics of that periodic task is actually not very different from all of the existing OpenStack. Nova has a bunch of tasks that right. run periodically to check power state, etc. Right? Right. right. So it's actually very similar to that. Right. So anything that applies to those tasks applies to these as well. Okay. Thank you. So, so after you've completed the, the discovery and you have this new environment, is the idea that you would continue to use it with both views? Like you, people are still using it as if it's a VMware environment and others are using it as an OpenStack environment at the same time? Are there any problems or conflicts that come so out of that? Ideally, you'd want them to switch to the OpenStack API because that's why you set it up in the first place. But the reality is that people do still continue using uh, vCenter specifically because it has, it has a nice interface, it has a well-established set of expertise around it, which is not necessarily the case on KVM. So that's why we built this whole synchronization piece, not only to be able to discover it, but um, there's a whole bunch of stuff that vCenter supports that um, OpenStack just doesn't, right? Like Pushkar demonstrated the template to uh, instance conversion. You just can't do that in OpenStack. So you have to go to vCenter and do it. And we had to make sure that um, the pieces that we were building were resilient to that. So we do allow that uh, dual view, but um, if the whole point is consuming the resources, you should be doing that through OpenStack because that's the best way to do it. And that's the reason people want OpenStack because 
B center is mostly administrator only. They want to open it up to their ah. internal users. All right. So we also have um, some t-shirts available in the front rows, so please help yourself. Okay, so if there are no more questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.